Slavery in India was an established institution in ancient India by the start of the Common Era, or likely earlier. However, its study in ancient times is problematic and contested because it depends on the translations of terms such as dasa and dasi. Slavery in India intensified during the Muslim domination of northern India after the 11th century, however, Muslim rulers did not introduce slavery to the subcontinent. It became a predominant social institution with the enslavement of infidels non-Muslims, along with the use of slaves in armies for conquest. According to Muslim historians of the Delhi Sultanate and the Mughal Empire era, after the invasions of non-Muslim kingdoms, Indians were taken slaves with many exported to Central Asia and West Asia. Many slaves from the Horn of Africa were also imported into the Indian subcontinent to serve in the households of the powerful or the Muslim armies of the Deccan Sultanates and the Mughal Empire. Slavery in India continued through the 18th and 19th century. During colonial time, many Indians were taken into different parts of the world as slave by the East India Company and the British Raj. The Portuguese imported African slaves into their Indian colonies on the Konkan coast between about 1530 and 1740. Slavery was abolished in the British Empire with the passage of the Slavery Abolition Act 1833 and criminalised in the British Raj in the Indian Penal Code of 1861. <laughs> <laughs> Slavery in ancient India According to Scott Levi, slavery was an established institution in ancient India by the start of the Common Era based on texts such as the Arthashastra, the Manumriti and the Mahabharata. Slavery was "...likely widespread by the lifetime of the Buddha", and it "...likely existed in the Vedic period", if the term dasas is interpreted as slaves, but states Levi, this association is problematic. The term dasa and dasi in Vedic and other ancient Indian literature has been interpreted as slave, but others contest it. Upinder Singh states that the Rig Veda is familiar with slavery, referring to enslavement in course of war or as a result of debt. She states that the use of dasa, Sanskrit, dasa and dasa in later times were used as terms for male and female slaves, suggests that initially ethnic differences may have been an important basis of enslavement. Some scholars contest the earlier interpretations of the term dasa as slave, with or without racial distinctions. According to Indologists Stephanie W. Jameson and Joel P. Brereton, known for their recent translation of the Rigveda, the dasa and dasi are human and non-human beings who are enemies of Arya. These according to the Rigveda, state Jameson and Brereton, are destroyed by the Vedic deity Indra. The interpretation of dasas as slaves in the Vedic era is complicated by hymns such as 2.12 and 8.46 that describe wealthy dasas who charitably give away their wealth. Similarly, state Jameson and Brereton, the racial distinctions is not justified by the evidence. According to the Indologist Thomas Troutman, the relationship between the Arya and dasa appears only in two verses of the Rigveda, is vague and unexpected since the dasa were in some ways more economically advanced. Than the Arya according to the textual evidence, according to Asko Parpola, the term dasa in ancient Indian texts has proto-saka roots, where dasa or daha simply means man. Both dasa and dasi are uncommon in Indo-Iranian languages including Sanskrit and Pali, and these words may be a legacy of the Pi root asterisk dens, and the word saka may have evolved from dasa, states Parpola. According to Micheline Ishe, a professor of human rights studies and sociology, the term dasa can be translated as slave. The institution represented unfree labor with fewer rights, but the supposed slavery in ancient India was of mild character and limited extent. Like Babylonian and Hebrew slavery, in contrast to the Hellenic world, the unfree labor could be of two types in ancient India, the Undaradsattva and the Ahitaka, states Ishe. A person in distress could pledge themselves for work leading to Undaradsattava, while under Ahitaka a person's unfree labor was pledged or mortgaged against a debt or ransom when captured during a war. These forms of slavery limited the duration of unfree labor, and such a slave had rights to their property and could pass their property to their kin, states Ishe. The term dasa appears in early Buddhist texts, a term scholars variously interpret as servant or slave. 
Buddhist manuscripts also mention kapyari, which scholars have translated as a legally bonded servant slave. According to Gregory Chopin, in the Mahavaharan Vinaya, the Buddha says that a community of monks may accept dasa for repairs and other routine chores. Later, the same Buddhist text states that the Buddha approved the use of Kalpikara and the Kapyari for labor in the monasteries and approved building separate quarters for them. Chopin interprets the term dasa as servants, while he interprets the Kalpikara and Kapyari as bondmen and slave respectively because they can be owned and given by laity to the Buddhist monastic community. According to Chopin, since these passages are not found in Indian versions of the manuscripts, but found in a Sri Lankan version, these sections may have been later interpolations that reflect a Sri Lankan tradition, rather than early Indian. The discussion of servants and bonded labor is also found in manuscripts found in Tibet, though the details vary. The discussion of servant, bonded labor and slaves, states Skopin, differs significantly in different manuscripts discovered for the same Buddhist text in India, Nepal and Tibet, whether they are in Sanskrit or Pali language. These Buddhist manuscripts present a set of questions to ask a person who wants to become a monk or nun. These questions inquire if the person is a dasa and dasa, but also ask additional questions such as, Are you artaka? and Are you vikrataka? The later questions have been interpreted in two ways. As, Are you one who has been seized? artaka and Are you one who has been sold? vikrataka respectively, these terms are interpreted as slaves. Alternatively, they have also been interpreted as, Are you doubtless? and Are you blameworthy? respectively, which does not mean slave. Further, according to these texts, Buddhist monasteries refused all servants, bonded labor and slaves an opportunity to become a monk or nun, but accepted them as workers to serve the monastery. The Indian texts discuss dasa and bonded labor along with their rights, as well as a monastic community's obligations to feed, clothe and provide medical aid to them in exchange for their work. This description of rights and duties in Buddhist Vinaya texts, says Chopin, parallel those found in Hindu Dharmasutra and Dharmasastra texts. The Buddhist attitude to servitude or slavery as reflected in Buddhist texts, states Chopin, may reflect a passive acceptance of cultural norms of the Brahmanical society midst them, or more justifiably an active support of these institutions. The Buddhist texts offer no hint of protest or reform. To such institutions, according to Chopin, Kautilya's Arthashastra dedicates the 13th chapter on Dasas, in his third book on law. This Sanskrit document from the Maurya Empire period 4th century BCE has been translated by several authors, each in a different manner. Shamasastri's translation of 1915 maps Dasa as slave, while Kangal leaves the words as Dasa and Karmakara. According to Kengel's interpretation, the verse 13.65.3 to 4 of Arthasastra forbids any slavery of an Arya in any circumstances whatsoever, but allows the Malechas to sell an offspring or keep it as pledge. Patrick Olivelle agrees with this interpretation. He adds that an Arya or Arya family could pledge itself during times of distress into bondage, and these bonded individuals could be converted to slave if they committed a crime thereby differing with Kengel's interpretation. According to Kangal, the Arthasastra forbids enslavement of minors and Arya from all four Varnas and this inclusion of Shudras stands different from the Vedic literature. Kangal suggests that the context and rights granted to Dasa by Kautilya implies that the word had a different meaning than the modern word slave, as well as the meaning of the word slave in Greek or other ancient and medieval civilizations. According to Arthashastra, anyone who had been found guilty of nishpatita Sanskrit, nishpatita ruined, bankrupt, a minor crime may mortgage oneself to become Dasa for someone willing to pay his or her bail and employ the Dasa for money and privileges. Shamasastri's 1915 foundational translation of the Arthashastra Shastra describes the rights of the Dasa, confirming Kangal's contention that they were quite different than slaves in other ancient and medieval civilizations. For example, it was illegal to force a Dasa slave to do certain types of work, to hurt or abuse him, or to commit rape against a female Dasa. Employing a slave dasa to carry the dead or to sweep orger, urine or the leavings of food, keeping a slave naked, hurting or abusing him, or violating the chastity of a female slave shall cause the forfeiture of the value paid for him or her. Violation of the chastity shall at once earn their liberty for them. When a master has connection sex with a pledged female slave dasa against her will, he shall be punished. 
When a man commits or helps another to commit rape with a female slave pledged to him, he shall not only forfeit the purchase value, but also pay a certain amount of money to her and a fine of twice the amount to the government. A slave dasa shall be entitled to enjoy not only whatever he has earned without prejudice to his master's work, but also the inheritance he has received from his father. The term dasa in Indic literature can mean slave, servant or when used as a suffix to a Bhagavan deity name, it refers to a pious devotee. <laughs> Slavery in medieval India Slavery escalated during the medieval era in India with the arrival of Islam. Wink summarizes the period as follows Slavery and empire formation tied in particularly well with Ikta and it is within this context of Islamic expansion that elite slavery was later commonly found. It became the predominant system in North India in the 13th century and retained considerable importance in the 14th century. Slavery was still vigorous in 15th century Bengal, while after that date it shifted to the Deccan where it persisted until the 17th century. It remained present to a minor extent in the Mughal provinces throughout the 17th century and had a notable revival under the Afghans in North India again in the 18th century. Slavery as a predominant social institution emerged from the 8th century onwards in India, particularly after the 11th century, as part of systematic plunder and enslavement of infidels, along with the use of slaves in armies for conquest. Islamic invasions 8th to 12th century AD Andre Wink summarizes the slavery in 8th and 9th century India as follows During the invasion of Muhammad al-Qasim invariably numerous women and children were enslaved The sources insist that now in dutiful conformity to religious law the one fifth of the slaves and spoils were set apart for the caliph's treasury and dispatched to Iraq and Syria the remainder was scattered among the army of Islam. At Rur, a random 60,000 captives reduced to slavery. At Brahmanabad 30,000 slaves were allegedly taken. At Multan 6,000. Slave raids continued to be made throughout the late Umayyad period in Sindh, but also much further into Hind, as far as Ujjain and Malwa. The Abbasid governors raided Punjab, where many prisoners and slaves were taken. Levi notes that these figures cannot be entirely dismissed as exaggerations since they appear to be supported by the reports of contemporary observers. In the early 11th century Tariq al-Yamini, the Arab historian al-Utbi recorded that in 1001 the armies of Mahmud of Ghazni conquered Peshawar and Wihand capital of Gandhara after Battle of Peshawar 1001, in the midst of the land of Hindustan, and enslaved thousands. Later, following his twelfth expedition into India in 1018-19, Mahmud is reported to have returned to with such a large number of slaves that their value was reduced to only 2-10 to ten dirhams each. This unusually low price made, according to Al-Utbi, merchants came from distant cities to purchase them, so that the countries of Central Asia, Iraq and Khorasan were swelled with them, and the fair and the dark, the rich and the poor, mingled in one common slavery. Delhi Sultanate 12th to 16th century AD. During the Delhi Sultanate period 1206 to 1555, references to the abundant availability of low-priced Indian slaves abound. Many of these Indian slaves were used by Muslim nobility in the subcontinent, but others were exported to satisfy the demand in international markets. The revenue system of the Delhi Sultanate produced a considerable proportion of the Indian slave population as these rulers, and their subordinate shikadars, ordered their armies to abduct large numbers of locals as a means of extracting revenue. While those communities that were loyal to the Sultan and regularly paid their taxes were often excused from this practice, taxes were commonly extracted from other, less loyal groups in the form of slaves. Thus, according to Barana, the Shamsi slave king. Balban R. 1266 ordered his shikadars in Awa to enslave those peoples resistant to his authority, implying those who refused to supply him with tax revenue. Sultan Alauddin Khalji R. 1296 is similarly reported to have legalized the enslavement of those who defaulted on their revenue payments. 
This policy continued during the Mughal era, an even greater number of people were enslaved as a part of the efforts of the Delhi sultans to finance their expansion into new territories. For example, while he himself was still a military slave of the Gurid Sultan Muis Uddin, Qutb Uddin Ibak R. 1206-10 as the first of the Shamsi slave kings invaded Gujarat in 1197 and placed some 20,000 people in bondage. Roughly six years later, he enslaved an additional 50,000 people during his conquest of Kalinjar. Later in the 13th century, Balban's campaign in Ranthambore, reportedly defeated the Indian army and yielded captives beyond computation. Levi states that the forcible enslavement of non-Muslims during Delhi Sultanate was motivated by the desire for war booty and military expansion. This gained momentum under the Khalji and Tuluk dynasties, as being supported by available figures. Zia Adin Barana suggested that Sultan Aladdin Khalji owned 50,000 slave boys, in addition to 70,000 construction slaves. Sultan Firuz Shah Tuluk is said to have owned 180,000 slaves, roughly 12,000 of whom were skilled artisans. A significant proportion of slaves owned by the sultans were likely to have been military slaves and not laborers or domestics. However earlier traditions of maintaining a mixed army comprising both Indian soldiers and Turkic slave soldiers Gilman, Mamluks from Central Asia, were disrupted by the rise of the Mongol Empire reducing the inflow of Mamluks. This intensified demands by the Delhi sultans on local Indian populations to satisfy their need for both military and domestic slaves. The Khaljis even sold thousands of captured Mongol soldiers within India. China, Turkestan, Persia, and Khorasan were sources of male and female slaves sold to Tuluk India. The Yuan dynasty emperor in China sent 100 slaves of both sexes to the Tuluk Sultan, and he replied by also sending the same number of slaves of both sexes. Topic: <inaudible> Mughal Empire, 16th to 19th century. The slave trade continued to exist in the Mughal Empire, however it was greatly reduced in scope, primarily limited to domestic servitude and debt bondage, and deemed mild and incomparable to the transatlantic slave trade. Abd Allah Khan Firuz Jang, an Uzbek noble at the Mughal court during the 1620s and 1630s, was appointed to the position of governor of the regions of Kalpi and Kare and, in the process of subjugating the local rebels, backquote backquote beheaded the leaders and enslaved their women, daughters and children, who were more than 200,000 in number. When Shah Shuja was appointed as governor of Kabul, he carried out a war in Indian territory beyond the Indus. Most of the women burnt themselves to death to save their honor. Those captured were distributed among Muslim manzabdars. The Augustinian missionary Fray Sebastian Manrique, who was in Bengal in 1629 30 and again in 1640, remarked on the ability of the Shikhtar a Mughal officer responsible for executive matters in the Pargana, the smallest territorial unit of imperial administration to collect the revenue demand, by force if necessary, and even to enslave peasants should they default in their payments, a survey of a relatively small, restricted sample of 77 letters regarding the manumission or sale of slaves in the Majmua i Wathaiku reveals that slaves of Indian origin Hindi al -Asal accounted for over 58% of those slaves whose region of origin is mentioned. The Kutut i Mamhora Bamar i Kadat i Bukhara, a smaller collection of judicial documents from early 18th century Bukhara, includes several letters of manumission, with over half of these letters referring to slaves of Indian origin. Even in the model of a legal letter of manumission written by the chief Qazi for his assistant to follow, the example used is of a slave of Indian origin. The export of slaves from India was limited to debt defaulters and rebels against the Mughal Empire. The Gakars of Punjab acted as intermediaries for such slave for trade to Central Asian buyers. <laughs> Fatawa i Alamgiri The Fatawa i Alamgiri also known as the Fatawa i Hindia and Fatawa i Hindia was sponsored by Aurangzeb in the late 17th century. It compiled the law for the Mughal Empire, and involved years of effort by 500 Muslim scholars from South Asia, Iraq and Saudi Arabia. The 30 volumes on Hanafi-based Sharia law for the empire was influential during and after Aurangzeb's rule, and it included many chapters and laws on slavery and slaves in India. Some of the slavery-related law included in Fatawa-i-Alamgiri were 
The right of Muslims to purchase and own slaves. A Muslim man's right to have sex with a captive slave girl he owns or a slave girl owned by another Muslim with master's consent without marrying her. A Muslim master's right to acknowledge or decline recognition of children born to slave girls he had sex with. A recognition that affected whether the slave's children would have any inheritance, the inability of infidels non -Muslims to inherit. No inheritance rights for slaves. The testimony of all slaves was inadmissible in a court of law. Slaves require permission of the master before they can marry. An unmarried Muslim may marry a slave girl he owns but a Muslim married to a Muslim woman may not marry a slave girl. Conditions under which the slaves may be emancipated partially or fully. Topic: <inaudible> Export of Indian slaves to international markets. Alongside Buddhist Orits, Christian Russians, Afghans, and the predominantly Shia Iranians, Indian slaves were an important component of the highly active slave markets of medieval and early modern Central Asia. The all-pervasive nature of slavery in this period in Central Asia is shown by the 17th-century records of one Juabari sheikh, a Naqshbandi Sufi leader, owning over 500 slaves, 40 of whom were specialists in pottery production while the others were engaged in agricultural work. High demand for skilled slaves, and India's larger and more advanced textile industry, agricultural production and tradition of architecture demonstrated to its neighbours that skilled labour was abundant in the subcontinent leading to enslavement and export of large numbers of skilled labour as slaves. Following their successful invasions, after sacking Delhi, Timur enslaved several thousand skilled artisans, presenting many of these slaves to his subordinate elite, although reserving the masons for use in the construction of the Bibi Khanum Mosque in Samarkand. Young female slaves fetched higher market price than skilled construction slaves, sometimes by 150%. <inaudible> Under early European colonial powers According to one author, in spite of the best efforts of the slave-holding elite to conceal the continuation of the institution from the historical record, slavery was practiced throughout colonial India in various manifestations. In reality, the movement of Indians to the Bukharan slave markets did not cease and Indian slaves continued to be sold in the markets of Bukhara well into the 19th century. Topic: 17th century. Slavery existed in Portuguese India after the 16th century. Most of the Portuguese, says Albert D. Mandelslow, a German itinerant writer, have many slaves of both sexes, whom they employ not only on and about their persons, but also upon the business they are capable of, for what they get comes with the master. The Dutch, too, largely dealt in slaves. They were mainly Abyssian, known in India as Habshis or Sheeds. The curious mixed race in Kanara on the west coast has traces of these slaves. The Dutch Indian Ocean slave trade was primarily mediated by the Dutch East India Company, drawing captive labour from three commercially closely linked regions the western, or southeast Africa, Madagascar, and the Mascarene Islands, Mauritius and Reunion, the middle, or Indian subcontinent, Malabar, Karamandal, and the Bengal, Arakan coast, and the eastern, or Malaysia, Indonesia, New Guinea, Irian Jaya, and the southern Philippines. The Dutch traded slaves from fragmented or weak small states and stateless societies in the east beyond the sphere of Islamic influence, to the company's Asian headquarters, the Chinese colonial city of Batavia, Jakarta, and its regional center in coastal Sri Lanka. Other destinations included the important markets of Malacca, Malacca and Makassar, Ujungpandang, along with the plantation economies of eastern Indonesia, Maluku, Ambon, and Banda Islands, and the agricultural estates of the southwestern Cape Colony. South Africa. On the Indian subcontinent, Arakan, Bengal, Malabar, and Karamandal remained the most important source of forced labor until the 1660s. Between 1626 and 1662, the Dutch exported on an average 150 to 400 slaves annually from the Arakan Bengal coast. During the first 30 years of Batavia's existence, Indian and Arakanese slaves provided the main labour force of the company's Asian headquarters. 
Of the 211 manumitted slaves in Batavia between 1646 and 1649, 126 .71 came from South Asia, including 86 40 from Bengal. Slave raids into the Bengal estuaries were conducted by joint forces of Ma pirates, and Portuguese traders chattans operating from Chittagong outside the jurisdiction and patronage of the Estado da India, using armed vessels galias. These raids occurred with the active connivance of the Tong Ngu Tongu rulers of Arakan. The eastward expansion of the Mughal Empire, however, completed with the conquest of Chittagong in 1666, cut off the traditional supplies from Arakan and Bengal. Until the Dutch seizure of the Portuguese settlements on the Malabar coast 1658 large numbers of slaves were also captured and sent from India's west coast to Batavia, Ceylon, and elsewhere. After 1663, however, the stream of forced labour from Cochin dried up to a trickle of about 50 to 100 and 80 to 120 slaves per year to Batavia and Ceylon, respectively. In contrast with other areas of the Indian subcontinent, Karamandal remained the centre of a sporadic slave trade throughout the 17th century. In various short-lived expansions accompanying natural and human-induced calamities, the Dutch exported thousands of slaves from the east coast of India. A prolonged period of drought followed by famine conditions in 1618-20 saw the first large-scale export of slaves from the Karamandal coast in the 17th century. Between 1622 and 1623, 1,900 slaves were shipped from central Coromandel ports, like Pulicat and Divanampatanam. Company officials on the coast declared that 2,000 more could have been bought if only they had the funds. The second expansion in the export of Coromandel slaves occurred during a famine following the revolt of the Nayaka Indian rulers of South India Tanjivar, Senji, and Madurai against Bijapur overlordship 1645 and the subsequent devastation of the Tanjivar countryside by the Bijapur army. Reportedly, more than 150,000 people were taken by the invading Dakani Muslim armies to Bijapur and Golconda. In 1646, 2,118 slaves were exported to Batavia, the overwhelming majority from southern Karamandal. Some slaves were also acquired further south at Tandi, Adirampatnam, and Kyalpatnam. A third phase in slaving took place between 1659 and 1661 from Tanjavur as a result of a series of successive Bijapuri raids. At Nagapatnam, Pulikat, and elsewhere, the company purchased 8,000 to 10,000 slaves, the bulk of whom were sent to Ceylon while a small portion were exported to Batavia and Malacca. A fourth phase 1673 started from a long drought in Madurai and southern Karamandal starting in 1673, and intensified by the prolonged madurai maratha struggle over Tanjavur and punitive fiscal practices. Between 1673 and 1677, 1,839 slaves were exported from the Madurai coast alone. A fifth phase occurred in 1688, caused by poor harvests and the Mughal advance into the Karnatak. Thousands of people from Tanjavur, mostly girls and little boys, were sold into slavery and exported by Asian traders from Nagapatnam to Aceh, Johor, and other slave markets. In September 1687, 665 slaves were exported by the English from Fort St. George, Madras. Finally, in 1694 96, when warfare once more ravaged South India, a total of 3,859 slaves were imported from Karamandal by private individuals into Ceylon. The volume of the total Dutch Indian Ocean slave trade has been estimated to be about 15 30% of the Atlantic slave trade, slightly smaller than the Trans Saharan slave trade, and one and a half to three times the size of the Swahili and Red Sea coast and the Dutch West India Company slave trades. Topic: 18th to 20th century. Between 1772 and 1833, the British Parliament debates, as recorded in Hansard, confirmed the existence of extensive slavery in India, primarily for Arabian and European colonial markets under the East India Company. When Britain abolished slavery in its empire, through Slavery Abolition Act 1833, it included a clause that allowed slavery inside India and enslavement of Indians for colonial markets operated by the East India Company. Andrea Major notes, 
In fact, 18th century Europeans, including some Britons, were involved in buying, selling, and exporting Indian slaves, transferring them around the subcontinent or to European slave colonies across the globe. Moreover, many 18th century European households in India included domestic slaves, with the owner's right of property over them being upheld in law. Thus, although both colonial observers and subsequent historians usually represent South Asian slavery as an indigenous institution, with which the British were only consonred as colonial reforms, until the end of the 18th century Europeans were deeply implicated in both slave holding and slave trading in the region. When the abolition did come into play in 1843, the officials that inadvertently used the term slave would be reprimanded, but the actual practices of servitude continued unchanged. Scholar Indrani Chatterjee has termed this, "...abolition by denial." In the rare cases when the anti-slavery legislation was enforced, it addressed the relatively smaller practices of export and import of slaves, but it did little to address the agricultural slavery that was pervasive inland. The officials in the Madras Presidency turned a blind eye to agricultural slavery, claiming that it was a benign form of bondage that was in fact preferable to free labour. According to Sir Henry Bartle Frere, who sat on the Viceroy's Council, there were an estimated 8 million or 9 million slaves in India in 1841. In Malabar, about 15% of the population were slaves. Slavery was officially abolished in India by the Indian Slavery Act 5 of 1843. Provisions of the Indian Penal Code of 1861 effectively abolished slavery in India by making the enslavement of human beings a criminal offence. Indentured labour system after the United Kingdom abolished slavery by the mid-19th century, it introduced a new indentured labour system that scholars suggest was slavery by contract. According to Richard Sheridan, quoting Dukin, the plantation owners continued to apply or sanction the means of coercion common to slavery, and in this regard the Indians fared no better than the ex-slaves." In this new system, they were called indentured laborers. South Asians began to replace Africans previously brought as slaves, under this indentured labor scheme to serve on plantations and mining operations across the British Empire. The first ships carrying indentured laborers left India in 1836. In the second half of the 19th century, indentured Indians were treated as inhumanely as the enslaved people previously had been. They were confined to their estates and paid a pitiful salary. Any breach of contract brought automatic criminal penalties and imprisonment. Many of these were brought away from their homelands deceptively. Many from inland regions over a thousand kilometers from seaports were promised jobs, were not told the work they were being hired for, or that they would leave their homeland and communities. They were hustled aboard the waiting ships, unprepared for the long and arduous four-month sea journey. Charles Anderson, a special magistrate investigating these sugarcane plantations, wrote to the British colonial secretary declaring that with few exceptions, the indentured labourers are treated with great and unjust severity, plantation owners enforced work in plantations, mining and domestic work so harshly, that the decaying remains of immigrants were frequently discovered in fields. If laborers protested and refused to work, they were not paid or fed, they simply starved. <inaudible> Contemporary slavery According to a Walk Free Foundation report in 2016, there were 46 million people enslaved worldwide in 2016. There were 18.3 million people in India living in the forms of modern slavery, such as bonded labor, child labor, forced marriage, human trafficking, forced begging, among others. The existence of child slavery in South Asia and the world has been alleged by NGOs and the media. With the Bonded Labor Prohibition Act 1976 and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights concerning slavery and servitude, a spotlight has been placed on these problems in the country. One of the areas identified as problematic were granite quarries. See also Veth India. History of slavery in Asia Child labor in India Labor in India